This year, I will have been in the emergency services in Polk County for 27 years. Um, I am a level two certified firefighter. I'm a EMT and I'm also an emergency rescue technician. Um, a lot of specialty courses on top of that that I hold that I've done over the years. <clears throat> ACTS as a whole is very, very conscientious on life safety. Um, we have systems that throughout all our communities and you know, from fire extinguishers to our alarms, to our sprinkler systems, to everything that we, we feel like to keep everyone safe. A lot of you should know, but a lot of you ask, what are life safety systems? A life safety system are equipment and procedures that help us are to be safe during plan emergencies. Examples, as everyone can see, we got our exit signs, evacuation routes, emergency generators and emergency lighting, fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems, a fire alarm system, and our fire drills. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exit signs and emergency evacuation routes. This is just kind of a cut and paste picture put in the slide here, but we have them posted in the hallways of where, from your apartment, where is the best place for you to go. Or even if you're not in your apartment, if you're in that area. Um, you know, if someone is visiting someone in a building and the alarm goes off, they kind of need to know where to go. Um, so I always pay attention to those signs. And it's not just good for here. You know, I go somewhere on vacation or whatever and I go to a hotel. I, one of the first kind of things I kind of look for is, you know, if this alarm goes off at 2 o'clock in the morning, where do I go? Yeah. <laughs> Exit marketing. All our doors have exit signs over them that we are required, that's a requirement to have if it is a certified exit. As you see in this room here, we got to exit sign that door and that door. There is not one over the door going out into the lobby in the event of if the fire alarm goes off, we don't really want everyone running in, in there because the fire may not just be in here. Um, you know, a lot of people get kind of confused sometimes and say, well, if the fire is over here, you know, there's a door. I always look around and go the opposite way of where the, the fire is at if it was to be in here. Um, you know, they must be visible, free of decorations and signs you cannot cover them. That is one thing when the fire marshal comes out and does our walk, he looks at very very closely. Emergency lighting. This picture here is a battery powered emergency light. You do not see any of, of these in the community. I have a few of them like say in my generator room to where in the event the power goes out and the generator does not start, I have light in there to see what's going on with the generator, to see why. All our emergency lighting that we have in the hallways is on the generator power. There is no battery powered lights except for just in a few spaces that I need them. You know, in this, it's not just fire safety. We're talking about the whole life safety system. This is not a picture of our generator. Um, we have one generator other than the one at the guardhouse, but one generator that does the main, the whole campus here. It's a, it's a big cat 650 kW generator that does our whole facility here. Um, we provide emergency power in common areas. As a lot of you have been here and seen when we have a power outage, you've got lights in the hallways, you've got exit signs, you've got elevators that work. Our fire alarm systems still work, of course. Um, there is no power whatsoever in any residential apartment in the event of a power outage. So that's where we always discuss and talk about in little blurbs of, you know, keep a flashlight handy just in case we no one ever knows. Um, we do have power in some in the rooms in our healthcare building that's required by state. Um, oxygen concentrators and 
things of that nature. But in every OBT room, for example, there's one outlet in there that's on emergency power. Um, there's outlets in the Willowbrook rooms. Um, the generator runs our kitchen. A lot of stuff in the clubhouse. Um, not everything, but a lot of stuff. Um, the generator runs every Tuesday morning at 9.30, it comes on, and runs for about 30 minutes, just to say it's an auto start feature so we know that the generator will crank. Um, every month we do actually a load test. Um, we have We have nine transfer switches on the property here. Every month we are required to start it by a different transfer switch. In the event of we have a power outage, we know that that transfer switch at that time was sending the signal back to crank the generator. Um, we have had times here that a building, the clubhouse, healthcare building has had power. No problems whatsoever, but we've had problems in the feeder coming into B building. So the generator was running, but it was just servicing B building at that time. So not all the time, just because it's running, does that mean your power that, you know, why do I have power? My neighbor doesn't have power. Uh, we've had a lot of, lot of different things with that. Like I said, we run it in house weekly, monthly. We run it for an hour when we're doing the servicing or the testing of the transfer switches. Twice a year it is tested by our vendor. Uh, one time a year they come out and do a service on it. One of these two times they come out and do a service on it. The next time when they come out, which is usually in like June, July, in the middle of summer, they actually come out and service it, 100% service, and they do what they call a load bank test. You will see a trailer parked out there, they're running cables everywhere, and they actually, every hour, up the the draw off that generator till they get it up to 75% of the total capacity of the generator for a, an hour they run it at the end. It's a, about a six hour test that it takes to do that. It's pretty intense, it's pretty hard on the generator, but yet it's putting a true load on it to make sure that everything's good. <clears throat> Fire extinguishers. Everyone sees, oops, walking through the building, everyone sees fire extinguishers everywhere. You know, I tell everyone they're here. We do not require you to know how to use a fire extinguisher. I don't, if you're even the least little bit scared of using a fire extinguisher and there's a fire, I don't want you to, to do it. They're there for some people that want to, that feel comfortable with it. They're there for our protection, that I can grab one if I need it. Um, the best thing to tell everyone is, if you feel safe with it, it's okay, but you gotta know your limits. So, but we will do briefly touch on how to use a fire extinguisher in this program. Um, everyone's probably heard of it, we call the PASS method. The first piece, pull the pin. You know, it's a, so allow you to squeeze the handle in order to discharge the, the powder that's in the extinguisher. The A is the aim. Aim it at the base of the fire, sweeping. Well, we'll get to that one in a minute, but aim it at the base of the fire. S, squeeze the handle to let it, the powder come out. And then the last S, sweep side to side at the base of the fire. Um, a lot of people think sometimes up higher is getting like higher and letting it rain down on it. Your contents that's burning is at the base of it most of the time. So if you start at the bottom, you're putting the powder on the true part of the fire. Um, you know, just because you squirt the extinguisher on it and the fire goes out immediately, keep your eye on it. I have seen them in time. You spray the extinguisher on it, and they think, okay, it's out. They turn their back and start walking away from the door, or towards the door, and it ignites back up. I always tell everyone, if you do that, squeeze it, put the fire out, back out 
looking at it just to make sure that it doesn't for safety's sake. When not to fight a fire. <clears throat> if you don't have the proper extinguisher, equipment, or training, you know, if the fire is spread beyond its point of origin, or if, or if that little voice inside your head just tells you to get out. You know, if you walk in here and you've seen this whole room blazing, it's not going to do any good. Get out. Let their big red truck pull up. And as, a, as we've always said, put the wet stuff on the red stuff. They come in and knock it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Automatic sprinkler systems. We've got two different style of systems here now. When this, when we done this presentation, made this presentation, we didn't have the, the other head that we're going to discuss here in a minute. But a lot of your apartments have the pendant style head, as you see in a lot of the common areas, hallways, and everything. They're extremely effective. They're actually spaced to cover an 11 foot area. Each sprinkler head will independ independently operate. So if you see the glass vial in the middle or the red vial, when with that being red right there, that is, there's different colors for those. At the red, that's 155 degrees. That once, a, once it reaches 155 degrees, it will actually, that it, liquid will expand and blow that glass bead out of there and then water will come out. <clears throat> the, down at the bottom, the quarter size head with the little slots in it, that's the, for the water hits for it to make it spray pattern, to throw it out. A lot of people have asked before, you know, if this head right here goes off, does that mean this one's going off? No, like I said, they're independently heat sensitive when it reaches temperature, it will go off if need be. The types of sprinkler systems used around here, we have a wet pipe system, which is what is everyone has in their apartment. Water is on it at all times. If that bulb gets busted, if fire heat sets it off, water is there and ready to come out. And trust me, it will make a mess. It is a lot of pressure, and there's no e no quick and easy way to cut them off. You know, if one goes off in an apartment that we have had before, it's happened. You know, you run and turn after we see there's no fire. If there's a fire, of course, I want it to do its thing. But once the fire's out, I'm gonna valve it off. But I have to go turn valves off to shut the water to the hole floor down and drain it out to get the pressure off of it. They do make tools that you can put in there and plug them. Um, when, I took a mer when I took sprinkler systems in the fire service, we didn't have a little tool that you put in there. It's like a little ratchet that spreads it out to stop the water. They actually made us take two, two wedges, two blocks of wood, and stand up there and reach above us and slide them in to drive a wedge in it to stop the water. Um, you do go home wet. <clears throat> a dry pipe system. It's a system under pressure with air in the pipes. On our back dock, for example, we have a dry system there. In our shop, we've got an air compressor sitting there that keeps air pressure on that line. In the event that the heads go off, once that air is released, there's a what they call a flapper valve in there that changes states and puts water on the system. Once the air, once the air pressure right here is released, it pushes it, the water pushes it up over the air pressure and puts water on the system. You see a lot of the dry pipe systems in areas that are outside to prevent the water from freezing in the winter time. Um, our system out in front of healthcare, if anyone's ever noticed in the um, Breezeway, Porkshire, at Healthcare, we have a sprinkler system in there. It actually is a, what they call a glycol system. It actually has 
glycol in the line to keep the water from freezing instead of a, a dry system. It's a wet system with an agent added to keep the water from freezing, which is tested yearly. Both systems are inspected. We have on here quarterly. We every, let's see, March, June, September, and December. When you hear it, when we put the notice up saying we're having quarterly sprinkler test and we're draining the water and the bells are going off, that's, that's what we're doing. We hook a hose up outside. There's an inspector here from our vendor. He turns, it, turns the valves on, pushes water back. He's checking the pressure that's coming in from the town to make sure we have adequate pressure. Um, we have different kind of five-year testing with heads and everything. There's a lot more down the line, but that is the quarterly testing of our sprinkler system to make sure that no valves are stuck, water is there, and it's ready to go in the event of an emergency. Also, you'll see out on the front of the buildings there, <clears throat> this says Siamese Connection, but ours just says FDC. If you look on the front of A building and B building in different locations, You'll see a sign there over the planter there. That, that, what that is for is in the event we did have a large fire here. The fire department could actually come up, hook their fire truck to that, and actually push more water in the system in the event you had a lot of heads activated from a large fire to help put the fire out. Our fire alarm systems. It's the most important, it's not possibly the most, it is the most important, I feel like, to warn everyone. Automatic detection of the fire or smoke. It also detects if you have a low water flow. We've had times that the alarms have went off and you get here and it's, it's just triggered it because it's saying the town has done something with water pressure or something and it, it reads saying we don't have enough water. So it, it sends off an alarm. <clears throat> Our alarms are monitored by a central monitoring station. They automatically dispatch the fire department in the event of an alarm. Everyone knows the Columbus Fire Department's just right up here in town. Usually, I would say less than 10 minutes they're here. Um, our alarm system is addressable to some portion. Um, it has been updated over the years in our healthcare building that actually tells you if the alarm goes off in healthcare, what room it is, where it's at 100%. <clears throat> in our residential buildings, we have an, what we call an addressable system, or a non-addressable, sorry. It will tell us second floor DEF. It'll give us a location close. It doesn't just say A building, we have to look through the whole A building. It tells us ABC or DEF or B building, GHJ or KLM. And you know, if it's a water flow, it'll say second floor or first floor water flow device. So it gets you close in the areas Resident rooms are not, the smoke detectors are not tied into the fire department, to our central monitoring system. Any time the, the alarm goes off in your apartment, it, it happens. And there's, you know, burn the bacon or the toast or just things happen. Um, if you do burn the bacon, burn the toast, please keep your door closed to your apartment and open your windows. Call the front desk and say, hey, I burnt some toast. Don't be embarrassed about it. I, my wife burns the toast every time she cooks it. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, if you leave your door open to try to get the smoke out of your apartment and it goes into the hallway and it sets that alarm off, then the fire department's coming. So that's one of the biggest things we try to get people to understand is we know it's going to happen. You know, if it's too smoky in there and you can't take it, get out, call us. We'll come up and 
get in there and open doors, bring fans, whatever we need to do. Most of the time, you know, you open the door or open a window, turn your ceiling fan on it, it's gone in just a few minutes. Now, in the event that it is a real fire in your apartment and you have a major problem, you know, of course, get out. Warn someone. I don't, you know, I, I want to say I want the alarm to go off as quick as it can. But I don't really want you to leave your door open to take the benefits of raging fire to spread out in the hallway to cause more problems. You know, we do have two-hour firewalls between apartments. The doors are one-hour fire rated, your apartment door. That is why we talk about in the laundry rooms, the big notices and the discussion that's been going, please keep the doors closed. Those are a fire door. In the event a dryer shorts out or lint, you know, things can happen in laundry rooms, seems like before everywhere else, but it's to protect the rest of the building and protect the residents. So <clears throat> the way the rule is with a fire door is if you're in there, the door can be propped open. So if if you're in doing laundry in the laundry room, yes, you can prop those doors open while you're in there, but if you leave to go to your apartment and you're the only one in there, you you're required, required by law, just you're supposed to close the door when you leave. Um, we did take down the, take the kick down door stops off of the laundry room doors here recently and put on the little magnetic ones so it's easier for everyone to transverse. You know, before it was hard if you had your, your walker or just a hard time bending over to get the kick down door stop up. So we did get this new style that's a magnetic catch so when you open it up if you slam it real hard it's not going to make contact if you just open it easy it will actually the two magnets will connect and lock so then in the event now of leaving the laundry room all you got to do is just tug on it just a little bit and the door will close um, getting but getting back to our fire alarm system those are also inspected it says semi-annually here, but we, we've took it one step further here. We have ours tested quarterly as well. Um, we feel like that's a very important piece that I want to keep up with, and we do it more often. Fire alarms and fire drills. So like we talked about earlier, know your evacuation route. Um, you know, a lot of this is there's a lot of different rules that we have to, to do between healthcare and independent living. Um, you know, we tell everyone to look and know their surroundings. In the healthcare building, it's a little different. I have to do fire drills in there once a month. That is a requirement by state. I do them on different shifts. Um, for example, this month I have to come, I have to do one on second shift to test the nurses to see if they know what they're doing in the event of a fire. In the next month I come in, I, I surprise them and they love to see me at three o'clock in the morning to get up. I walk in and say, surprise, it's time for a fire drill. Um, <clears throat> but the one good thing about it is I do not have to set the alarms off on the third shift drill. The way the rules read, it ha I have to hear it sound once a month. So on my months I have third shift in medical is the months that we do sprinkler testing and alarm testing. So we hear the alarms that month during the daytime when we're testing them. So I can walk in at 3 o'clock in the morning and tell the nurses, I'm not waking everybody up. Just come over here and let's walk through what we do. So it's... It really works out good because I really hate to wake them up just for, for no reason. But knowing your evacuation route is very, very important. Know the location of the fire alarm pull stations. You know, in the event we were talking about in your apartment and you had a fire and you want to get out and you close your door, you know, a lot of people think, well, okay, well, how do I let someone know without calling 911 or whatever? Everyone's seen the little red pull boxes like we have on the wall right over here. They're at the end. They're near every stairwell. 
There's one near every stairwell. So, you know, if you have a problem and if there's a fire and you see it and you go pull that, the fire truck's going to come. We had one just the other night. Uh, a family member wasn't sure what it was. A, grand, a grandchild, hey, it says pull this, so they pulled it. So, uh, not going to name any names, but, you know, it happens. It happens. In the residential wings, you know, in your apartment when the alarm sounds, fill the back of the door with your bare hand. Make sure that there is no heat. You know, you may be sitting in here watching TV, may not know there's a fire right outside your apartment. You know, oh, the alarm went off. If you feel the back of your door, if there is a lot of heat, if that door's hot, don't, don't open the door because you know the fire is right on you. You know, if the door's cool, you can exit and proceed to the nearest stairwell or fire safe area. If the door's hot, exit to the patio. If you're on the first floor, open your window and hang, a, or hang, and hang a towel out if you're on the second or third floor. That is just letting the fire department know that if we have to evacuate and come outside saying, hey, that window's open, there's a towel right here, that's to let, let them know what apartment can, to get their bearings to know which apartment cannot get out the door. Also, if you, if you can, wet a towel and put around at the base of your door. Smoke will kind of come in around the door, could come in around the door. That, that wet towel will keep it, the smoke from coming in somewhat, will help. I'm going to back up for one minute here. I, we were discussing this the other day, me and Nancy Peterson. Uh, there's not, we really didn't have a slide in here about our villas. Um, for our residents that live in the villas, or that may be watching this at home, or may watch it when we air it again in a few months, or whenever we do this on 900, but we have two detectors in the villas that are paired to our red alert system. So. If, the detect, if a fire alarm goes off in the villa, say in the kitchen, security and nursing will get a page over their pager that says fire alarm in villa seven. You know, so we know to go over there. There is nothing that's tied to the alarm system. It is just like your house at the villas. Um, we do have more detectors than just those two in the villas, but there's two that alarm us. So, you know, here again, in the event of you accidentally burn the toaster, whatever you're doing, just please call the front desk and let us know because we don't know if Doug and Nancy Peterson's at home or not, and we get a smoke detector over there, so we're kind of running over there to make sure nothing's on fire. But, you know, so if we kind of know that, hey, we just – this happened or whatever, we may come check on you or ask you if you need some help or whatever you need, we'll be glad to, but you know, it just kind of slows us down a little bit on making sure everyone is safe and secure. But the villas, you know, here again, it's the same way. You know, if your alarm goes off, if you have a fire, it'd be just like at your house. We want you to come out the front door, the garage door, the safest route you can get out and, and get out in the yard if there is a, a problem and wait there. Um, you know, there's been a lot of questions and concerns going back to talking about the evacuation, you know, in the common areas. You know, evacuate to the nearest stairwell or fire safe area. Remain in the fire safe area or at the building exit and stay calm. Wait instructions from ACT staff or the fire department personnel. We at ACTS feel like, and there's been a lot of questions, problems, discussions, you know, in the event of a fire, we know we want everyone really to be outside. But in our environment that we work in, 
that y'all live in, 99% of our alarms are false alarms. Now, I know there's always that 1% chance. But do I want to send every resident out of KLMB building at 2 o'clock in the morning and it raining, snowing, you know, 14 degrees outside? Outside. No. Elevators are not to be used, as we'll discuss in a, in a, when the alarm goes off. You're supposed to use a stairwell. You know, we have a lot of residents here that cannot traverse the steps. We have a lot of residents here that would, that their spouse would not even leave them. You know, to say, you wait here, I'm going on outside. I mean, who would? I don't think no one in this room would do their spouse that way. So, you know, it, it's, it's a safety aspect as well. It, it's kind of twofold. So, you know, if you are in the stairwell and the fire department's coming up that way, give them room to get up and, and let them get in here and make sure there's no problem, see what's going on. But I'm looking at the safety and security of the residents as well, too. You know, I don't want anyone going down the steps that's not good with steps, falling and breaking a hip, or falling and wiping out four or five more residents in the event of two o'clock in the morning, everyone's half asleep, or even in Ralph Collins' case, two o'clock in the afternoon, half asleep. Um, <laughs> hey, Ralph. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's if we if we were not a fully sprinkled building with the alarms and the technology and the firewalls and everything that we have here, it might be a little different, but I've, we have a safe building. And plus, you know, when we, the alarms go off, we try to go back and go to every stairwell and say, all clear. You know, sometimes at two o'clock in the morning or something, it takes a little while because we don't have a lot of staff here. Fire departments help with that, but we, we do do that. Um, yes? That, that was a good good point, but what what she was saying was was in the for those of you are at home and didn't hear the question was in the what happens if you have someone that's not mobile that can't get down the steps and we have to get them out in an emergency. The fire department was telling her you put them on a sheet and drag them down the steps now. That is not a comfortable way to go down the steps because we have done that in our training. You know, they do actually make now what they call stair chairs. They make uh, sleds that is a little bit more comfortable. Now, in the event of an emergency, and it depends on whether you've got a sore back in the morning or you're, you're still living, I'm going to, you know, I, sometimes I have to do what I have to do. But if it's not, you know, if we're in a, in a time that we can, we're going to take our time and do it the right way. You know, going back to that, in, well, I'm, we're not going to evacuate until you know we see that we need to evacuate, and then we will have fire personnel, rescue personnel. We will have personnel to help the ones that need to be assisted down. Um, you know, don't block the doors or the driveways like we talked about. Um, keep the noise to a minimum. I know that sounds crazy. I know everyone's out here wondering what's going on, what you know, talking, laughing, having a good time, but. But sometimes, you know, we're, we're in a building here and you get the emergency services here and they're trying to talk over here and talk to this one and, you know, all the noise and stuff sometimes. And because a lot of times radios are hard to work in these buildings with all the steel and metal. Um, but just keep it down if you can to where you can hear us communicating because if you're on third floor having a party up there waiting on us to tell you and someone hollers on first floor all clear, you, you may not hear the all clear. Um, you know, take the alarm seriously. You know, one of the biggest problems we have is we go over this, we talk about going to your stairwells, um, we talk about what to do in a fire alarm. 
we in the past have actually done, we're not required to do them in the independent living because everyone's independent living. That's why we post where to go and that's why we have these classes. You know, in the past we have done, tried to set up fire drills. You know, I've tried it two ways. I've tried it putting out notices. Hey, we're gonna do a fire drill on such and such a day at around such and such a time. Well, how convenient. That's when everybody knows what they're doing and they say, well, I believe I'll go to the grocery store today at this time so I don't have to pertain or be involved with a fire drill. You know, three weeks later you get a fire drill and that's the same residents peeking their head out of the door. What do I do? You know, it, it's, it's discouraging sometimes. You get some of them that just stick your head out the door and say, yeah, I know what to do. Okay, and when the real thing happens, they don't. I understand people panic. I understand in the heat of it, people do lose their bearings. They do get confused. I understand that, but you know, it's just sometimes you, you wanna see people being active in it, being proactive in it. You know, when, when the alarms go, oh, I'm sorry. When the alarms do go off and you evacuate your building, your room, Please leave your door unlocked. You know, in the event we have a fire, the fire department, if it's in that area, they're going to go in your room. Now, they have, we have keys to give them and everything, but, you know, sometimes these young boys with the axe, they want to just see what they can tear up just because they can. Um, you know, I thought I smelled smoke, so I'm going to tear the door down. But, you know... A lot of you may have these, may not have them. Um, I have some with me today. If not, we have some more in the marketing office and everything. Little door tags that we ask, you know, if you think about it, if you're evacuating your room in a fire drill or a fire, if you can hang this on your door, that lets, I'm not saying we're still not gonna go in there and check and make sure that you're not in there, but it lets us know up front that, hey, no one's in this room. They're saying no one's in this room. You know, in the past, we have even asked if you go on vacation. It's not to be nosy, not for the neighbors to know where you're going, but, you know, if you leave to go on vacation, it lets us know that there's no one there. Not just necessarily during a fire drill, but if you leave to go off somewhere. Me and Dee were discussing the other day, we had some that over the years that were so into this that they would go to the grocery store. Well, let me put my tag out on the door. I, I'm not going to be gone but an hour, but, which is great. If that's what they want to do to keep it in their mind to let us know, there's no problem with that. Um, but if someone needs, wants some of these, I know Maintenance, Safety, and Security Committee, we have talked about it for years. I know Ralph said, you know, he's got his, I think, behind his door with a magnet holding it right there so he knows when he opens his door, it, it triggers him to say, Hey, I'm going out of town for the week or I fire drill. I know to hang this on the door here. So we do have some of these. If anyone's interested that does not have one, we'll be glad to do it, let you have one. Also, a few years back, uh, right two, three years ago, I think we worked on this paper right here. Um, we've come up and I've got some copies here and we can make some more. It's kind of a apartment independent living fire evacuation procedure. A good little two-sided page in there that you can also put a magnet on your door to just kind of familiarize yourself with, you know, in two months from now, standing there looking and say, oh, let me, let me remember what this says, you know, bullet points, never use the elevators, you know, different things to tell you. Uh, you know, we put in here to make sure you turn off your appliances, turn off your water. I know it sounds crazy in the event of a fire, why would you want to turn the water off? But it may not be in your apartment and we'd hate for something to overflow in your apartment and us already dealing with a mess with a fire down here, now we've got a flood over here. So turn off all that, dress appropriately. Just because I'm telling you to go to the stairwell in the middle of January at three o'clock in the morning does not mean that we may not have to move you outside if it is a real event. So I always kind of be sure to be a dress appropriately so if we do have to evacuate on out because it's not gonna be, well, let me run back in and get my coat. No, we're not gonna, not gonna be able to do that. 
Um, one thing that I failed to mention that we talked about is the fire doors. Um, those close automatically when the alarm goes off for different sections, different wings. Ne I never want anyone to breach a fire door, open a fire door. They close, they latch for a reason. You know, that we test them monthly. We test them every time, quarter when they set the alarms off. They are designed that when the magnets break from their location they're at to close and latch. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. We have an alarm or we're working on something. Well, somebody comes up and just opens the door and walks through it and barely opens it just enough to get through. Well, when they let it go, it doesn't have the proper speed to latch back and connect. So we need, those doors are there. They're a fire door to keep it from spreading from one wing or one hall to another. They are designed to latch and tested for a reason. Um, a lot of you have seen that we were doing some work on the fire doors here recently. Um, when we redone the hallways there, we got in some issues with flooring. We're not gonna bring all that up again, but, um, and the three point latching on the fire doors. So we actually had them come in for people to understand what we done. And we took the, the rods for the three point latching that go down to the floor out. And they put what they call, they call them a turkey pin. If everyone remembers you put the little popper in a turkey and when it pops out in the oven, it's done. It's kind of the same scenario with that. There's a pin that's in this door here and a rubber plug in this door. When those fire doors close in the event of a fire, once the temperature that those pins are designed reaches that temperature, it pops the pin out and pins the two doors together to where they cannot be open in the true event of a fire and heat on the back side of those doors. They do look a whole lot better. We've got the little catches out of the floor where no one can step in it in a pair of high heels. Uh, I mean, I think everything looks, everything is inspected, certified, and everything is good with that now. Um, 